Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Whether in Myeongdong, Yeouido, or in the famous Gangnam, skyscrapers and design buildings abound in Seoul. The South Korean capital, a city in ashes at the end of the Korean War, has become within a few decades a vibrant city and a fine example of architectural innovation and modernity. What fewer people know, however, is that recently there has also been a renewed interest in Korean traditional architecture. The Hanok, the Korean ancestral house, has become increasingly popular among South Koreans and the government is now actively promoting it, domestically and abroad. To learn more about the Hanok, its characteristics and history, as well as its current position in South Korean society, we met with Daniel Tendler, an architect specialized in the renovation of Hanoks in Seoul. Daniel Tendler initially studied economics at the University of Göttingen before changing field and studying architecture and urban planning at the University of Aachen in Germany. After graduation, he worked for a Korean architecture firm, a Kuga, during several years and eventually founded Urban Detail Seoul, a planning office for traditional and modern Korean architecture and design with two Korean partners. He also contributed to the foundation of the Chamuri Cooperative, a construction company focused on traditional Korean architecture. Daniel Tendler, welcome to Korea and the World. Hello. What brought you to Korea and how did you get into the field of traditional Korean architecture? Actually, the answer of the first question lies in the second part of it. The traditional architecture brought me to Korea. Hmm. I'm connected to Korea anyways uh, because my mother is Korean, but it was my wish to work in this field that made me come here. What are you trying to achieve as an architect uh, in Seoul? Are you here to be inspired or to experience something different? Or do you have some kind of a mission and maybe my guess would be making the Hanok, we're going to talk about that, uh, mainstream? I wouldn't call it mission because I don't like the word itself. It's a bit too strong, mm. but I think I found a task for a lifetime here working in this field. I would like to contribute to the whole field of Hanok, um, the remodeling and uh, restoration and to raise awareness about Korea's traditional architecture. And I think there's still a lot to do. Can you maybe tell us a bit about your background and how you got connected to this whole field of traditional Korean architecture? Was it in the course of your studies or generally because of your heritage? Um, actually, I was originally studying uh, economics. While studying that, I was sort of um, realized it was not my way to go. Mm -hmm. That time I did an uh, internship Uh, at a Korean Economic Research Institute because I thought maybe uh, I didn't want to work uh, in big companies or um, for a bank or whatever and I thought maybe research could be something but it turned out to be just as bad <laughs> I mean I got along well with people it was an interesting time but I realized okay that's not what I want to do so I started asking myself okay if this is not what I want to do what could it be then and since i didn't have an immediate answer i started mm. asking myself so what do i like and there were several things and one of those was the korean traditional architecture which i had been fascinated for a long time mm. but i never thought about making it my profession so i started thinking about it and i talked to lots of people i did a lot of research and finally the answer was okay i should study architecture to be able to do something in this field And so I decided to go back to school. So after I graduated from economics, I went back to architecture school and I studied architecture in Germany before I came here. So you are German. Uh, does this affect how well you are accepted as someone uh, working in a field that is obviously intrinsically Korean? You said you're, ha you're half Korean. Yes, but, uh, um, it is quite a delicate question because um, uh, at times traditional fields can be quite uh, exclusive, uh, in particular when it comes to mixed people. There's still, like, the idea of um, a pure Korean uh, nation, I don't want to say race, still, mm. still persistent in many people's heads. So for half Koreans, in some fields, I know cases when, where it proves to be very hard. Personally, I have to say, I've made quite positive experiences. Um, people have been very open to me. I'm not 100% sure how things would have looked had I decided to work in a totally traditional field, for example, as a traditional carpenter. Mm. But the carpenters I met and worked with, they have all been very open and friendly to me. But um, I have to consider, I work in this field as an architect, basically, with an um, educational background from Germany. Um, that makes my position slightly different from someone who is just um, committed to 
pure traditional mm. Hanok. And、um, in this way, I think I found my sort of niche. Before we go、uh, any further, could you maybe start by explaining the main characteristics of South Korean urbanism, especially in Seoul, and maybe start with how the city、um, developed since the end of the Korean War? Because、mm-hmm. if I am correct, everything here was more or less destroyed to a massive degree. Yes, maybe we can like reach a bit farther back because Seoul has a very rich and very long history. If you look at the the city, you can see that in the northern part. Uh, is where the original ancient city was located. People will usually refer to、um, the four big gates. Most tourists will see like the the main gates, like Namdaemun or Sungdaemun, Dongdaemun, and so on. And if you look at this area, you will realize how huge it is. It's it's a really vast area, and、um, old Seoul used to have about close to two hundred thousand inhabitants most of the time,、mm-hmm. which is really、um, huge in comparison to medieval European cities. Frankfurt at the time was maybe hovering around twenty thousand people, so、uh, image scale, of yeah, yeah, yeah how big the scale was for such an old city. That's、um, where the city started, and、um, the development in terms of urban planning started basically under the、uh, Japanese colonial rule. There were some attempts before that.、Um, parts of Seoul were electrified, and there was even an electric、um, tram system before that. But the actual planning started under the Japanese rule. So main roads were built、um, for、uh, vehicle traffic, the train stations, and so on. Seoul was also、uh, industrialized during that time.、Uh, then we have the break during the liberation and、mm. then Korean War, and the city was, as you mentioned, devastated. And after that, the rebuilding started, but the the large scale projects were pursued. In, I would say in the seventies, when they started to build the southern parts of the city, south of the Han River. So even today, you can read this history.、Um, if you look, just look at the map of Seoul. In the northern part, you will see very orga- organic and small-scale structures. Still, lots of small alleys. And in the southern part, you have very、uh, a very linear system.、Mm. So you have、um, two main parts of the city: the northern part and the southern part, part which are very very different in, in their characteristics. And、um, you see also development projects in the northern parts, but still they have to fit in, in into this old system, so they look different、mm. in many parts from the southern city. Nonetheless, what is、um, including the whole of, of of Seoul is brutal development approach of、um, demolishing like huge neighborhoods and rebuild them, which is in stark contrast to most urban、uh, development we see in Europe. Which is much on smaller scale, and in Korea,、um, it's on a big scale, and they erase basically all the footprints of the city, the roads, the structures, everything、um, is demolished and built anew. So it's an approach that is very,、um, I would say, alien sometimes for people from Europe or other places、mm. to see. Is there a specific agenda, so to speak, in a Korean urban planning? It sounds maybe a bit, a bit political, but let's say. Something that is done here different. I think、um, to understand why Seoul is this way, you have to look back at Korean roots in dictatorship, the development roots in dictatorship, where basically the state controlled the development. Even though in the I think the actual construction was handed over to private companies at some point in time, but nonetheless、um, the whole process, even up to today, clearly shows the signs of a totalitarian. State actually, for example,、mm. if an area is designated for redevelopment, well, they let people vote on it, like the inhabitants can vote on it. But if I think seventy percent decide they want to do the re- redevelopment project, the, the remaining thirty percent, the remaining thirty percent, yeah. yeah, they can't do anything.、Mm. So property rights are basically up to today quite weak here, and this is a reason why even nowadays,、um, yeah, large scale projects are still possible here. That would be very difficult to pursue in in Europe. So in a way, it's maybe something positive, even though it's too aggressive. Well, I personally basically see more negative sides.、Mm-hmm. Though I see that、um, at some point in in development in Korea, it was maybe necessary to produce lots of units in a large scale. Not so much because of the population density, which is a common、um, misunderstanding. If you build like high-rise buildings. What you gain、uh, in a vertical direction, you lose in the horizontal directions because the distance between the buildings rise as the higher one building one building gets, and so in the end, in redeveloped neighborhoods, the population den- density is usually not higher than before.
Hmm. It was rather um, a question of doing it in an efficient way. You have lots of identical units and they could build them very quickly. Uh, and this is actually why they did it. Let's talk now about the Hanok. One area particularly uh, popular with visitors in Seoul is Bukchon. It mm -hmm. consists mainly of Korean traditional houses, the, the Hanoks, and it's uh, in the vicinity of Seoul's main palaces. But while the government promotes it as a tourism hotspot, the number yeah. of Hanoks has actually been falling. So my data here is a little old, outdated, but there were apparently 20,000 Hanok in Seoul in 2005, only mm -hmm. 14,000 in 2009. Yes. So maybe my first question would be, are these traditional buildings uh, more popular with foreign visitors than with Koreans themselves. In Pukjeon, the number of Hanoks, I think it's it's around 1,000. Mm -hmm. So they make up just um, a small part of of the whole. And within Pukjeon, I don't think um, the number of Hanoks has decreased in the past years. There was a, a time in the mid 90s uh, where huge, huge parts of Pukjeon were demolished. Ironically, it was shortly before the Asian crisis, and people realized it would get difficult to make money out of redevelopment. So they changed their mind and. The protective laws were reinforced in that area. So I think from the year 2000 on, the number of Hanoks in Pukchun has not decreased, but in other areas. And the thing is, um, many Hanoks that are left in Seoul are not visible. They're in some like back alleys, and many of them are like um, covered up with signboards and whatever. Mm. So at, at first sight, you wouldn't even realize it's a Hanok. That's one of the reasons. and. There is some truth to that foreigners um, like Hanok maybe sometimes even more than Koreans do. <laughs> I've been asked time and again by friends who are visiting, uh, what did they do to their own architecture, to, to their like historic heritage? And it's always a very um, difficult question to, to answer. And also, if you look at the whole process of how Hanoks became protected, not protected again, but promoted and... Uh, got back into focus, the focus of interest. Um, I think there are some foreigners who played quite a significant mm. role in it. How do Koreans, in your perception, see Hanok? Something positive in general? Or do many people see Hanok as some kind of relic of the past, something that is not mm. practical in everyday life and should be maybe at some point removed? Yeah, I think it's, it's very mixed. Mm. Uh, in past days, Hanok as much as uh, other things, traditional Korean things, was seen as backboards. Um, as you mentioned, uh, uncomfortable cold mm. in winter and uh, in particular people in old neighborhoods that prior to their um, renovation, they have this um, image, this bad image of a Hanok and many of those people even long to live in a modern building to have like better standards. So on the one side we do have this uh, image of, of something backwards uncomfortable but on the other hand, um, in particular since um, yeah, starting with the new millennium, also, within Korea and uh, Koreans, interest in Hanok has increased a lot. The city of Seoul started giving subsidies for the renovation of Hanoks, so more and more people started to renovate it, and people started to see what you could do out of those places. And I think Koreans now have a sort of um, yeah, a longing for a more profound culture identity, I would, mm. I would say, because Koreans also realized that yeah, they realize what they have lost with um, their own architecture, not only architecture, but also all their other cultural estates, many of them that have been almost like distinct, mm. but like experience a sort of like revival these days. Maybe looking for something more organic, more humane than all these cookie cutters you can see in Seoul. Yeah, if you, if you mm. look at the apartments, which are very comfortable, and I would say well, they're doing actually quite a good job with the interior. I don't like that much the whole... Uh, yeah, from an urban uh, point of view, I think it's not unproblematic, but if you look at the interior, you can understand why Koreans like it. Everything is taken care of, it's very comfortable. In those small organic neighborhoods, you always have a problem finding a place for your car to, to park, and you have to take care of your yeah. hanok. Uh, it takes a lot of work to, to maintain it. So I can understand why people um, actually prefer or prefer to live in, in, in those apartments. But if you look at the apartments, you will realize it's rather a consumer good. They're all identical. Just like you use a car, um, you try to get a bigger one next time. You try to move into a, a nicer neighborhood, um, a bigger apartment. So it's nothing that you identify yourself with. It's yeah, it's it's consumer good. I don't mean it like in a total negative way, mm. but I think that's how you could consider it. 
Do you see differences in how Westerners and especially Europeans um, treat their architectural architectural heritage mm -hmm. and how Koreans do? And I think you already mentioned it, how in Europe we are more likely to protect even minor heritage compared yes. to, to Seoul. That's actually a very important question because um, as an architect coming from such a background, I also um, I worked at the lab of architecture history at the University of Aachen, mm -hmm. where I studied. So my education was is based on this concept of seeing things. There is a sort of difference between Koreans and Europeans in this approach. Europeans, um, they put big emphasis on uh, maintaining as much original uh, substance as possible. Korea, it's more of a living um, yeah, craftsmanship mm. and cultural estate. So if you compare it, for example, in, in Germany, You have much more original substance than you have in Korea, like historic substance. Lots of um, yeah, half-timbered houses, Fachwerkhäuser, we call them in Germany. Mm. The town where I was born, um, I think there are more historical buildings than in Pukchon. <laughs> so you have this, this uh, huge original substance left. But on the other hand, if you consider the craftsmanship, it's basically not existent anymore. Because, for example, the, if you consider the carpenters, The traditional profession of a carpenter is just evolved into a mo the modern carpenter, and there's modern carpenters who can do like the reconstruction work, who get skills to do it. But um, the actual old profession has ceased to exist in Korea. On the contrast, mm -hmm. these old craftsmanship still exist today, and I think it's something we might forget, and it cannot be valued high enough that we still have this craftsmanship. But um, on the other hand, again. It should not be an excuse to demolish um, really precious old substance, which still happens even up to mm. today. Can a small um, hanok receive a, a label as protected heritage, or is this only reserved for large temples or major heritage? The thing is, uh, in Korea, the protective laws usually just um, include religious buildings, the palaces, or some outstanding estates, and not so much old everyday architecture, mm. profane architecture. So um, that's a huge difference also to the European approach. In, in, in Germany, like many old daily buildings would be included in those protective laws, whereas in Korea, it's not the case. Also in Pukchon, you can get subsidies, for example, if you demolish an old Hanuk and just build another Hanuk and a new Hanuk on it. So uh, it doesn't, it's mm. not required to preserve uh, what you find there. Is Seoul representative for the whole country? Can we see more traditional architecture, and especially Hanoks, in other cities such as Busan or Daegu or Daejeon? I would say Seoul definitely has one of the biggest mm. Hanok stocks uh, in the country. There is, in most major cities, you have some leftovers. In Busan, for example, there is quite some interesting architecture, architecture left from the colonial period. I know there is also quite some units left in Daegu. But I would say um, for a closed area with um, mainly Hanuk buildings, Seoul would be the most outstanding example. It's different if you also include smaller places like um, the villages Hawe or Yangdong. Mm -hmm. They have been designated World Cultural Heritages. I don't know if the process is mm -hmm. already um, finished. But um, there you can find very well preserved old Korean towns that show the layout of, of the time the architecture of, of Joseon dynasty very well. In an article you initially published on Impactor, you stated that recent years have seen a boom in renovation and construction of traditional architecture in Korea. Why is that? If you look at the um, field of construction in, in Korea, you can notice that starting maybe from the year 2000, there was a steep increase in uh, restoration and remodeling activities in Seoul. And uh, back then, the city of Seoul introduced a system of subsidies for the area of Pukchon mm. for the remodeling of, uh, of, of Hanok. And back then people started to uh, remodel their area, to maybe to have to mention as background information that um, the building restrictions in, in Pukchon were uh, released a couple of years before that, I think in the mid-90s, and people widely started to demolish their Hanoks in Pukchon. Like hundreds of, of units were lost in that time. 
And then uh, it was the Asian financial crisis, which ironically put an end to that because pe the people realized they couldn't make mm -hmm. as much money out of it anymore. And a sort of counter movement started in that area. So people started to see what they lose. And um, many people started to engage uh, in the protection of the Hanok. So also the city of Seoul started to realize yeah, that they would have to preserve at least parts of their cultural heritage to um, yeah, remain an attractive city. So subsidies uh, were given for the reconstruction and it started yeah, on small scale and it sort of got into an own dynamic, I would say. Mm. Um, as more and more people started to remodel the Hanoks, the property prices in Pukchon surged again um, because the, the whole area um, gained popularity and um, became much more attractive. Yeah, and this was basically the beginning of what we call the Hanuk boom. Mm -hmm. And later on, the subs like subsidized areas were increased to other areas west of uh, Gyeongbuk, which people call uh, Sotchon, which is basically not, not the official name, but the area is also called that way. And so the activities um, yeah, increased to that area. And nowadays, it is even said that Hanuks are going to be subsidized in the whole city of Seoul. So you, you have a, a stark increase in activities and also in people's um, interest in Hanok. Not just foreigners and tourists, but also Koreans themselves start getting like more and more interested yeah, in Hanok. And many people, many people say these days that it would be their dream to live in a Hanok one day, but since it's not cheap to remodel or build a Hanok, it proves quite a difficult task at times. Yeah. In the same article, you put the Hanok at the center of this change. Before asking you why that is the case, um, let us maybe discuss what is really the Korean Hanok, what are the characteristics mm -hmm. of the Hanok. So the first question, very ignorant question, what types of rooms does it have? Is there anything unique about that? Yes, uh, the basic types of rooms in Hanok are first uh, the Taechong, uh, which is the main hall, and uh, you have the wooden structure visible there. Then you have the closed rooms or pang, which used to have the ondol heating, which uh, uh, most people will know. and the kitchen, of course, called Puok, with a fireplace or cooking place that contributed to the, the ondol heating system uh, and a separated toilet or bathroom. So these are the basic uh, interior units in the Hanuk. The visible structure, as I mentioned, the Taechong, the closed rooms, which are usually um, finished with hanji, mm -hmm. which is the traditional paper. So we have a, a very nice contrast between the simple and plain rooms and the rather um, decorative structure in the main hall. And also important, if you step out of the house and consider the outside, is the courtyard. Mm. Of course, a courtyard is a very um, universal uh, thing in architecture. You find many, many uh, cultures and countries where you have courtyards. But it's very, very important for um, the understanding of, of Hanuk, the function of the courtyard and the interior. It always corresponds with each other. With each other and the courtyards always had very important uh, functions. So even in the smallest Hanuk, you will always have a little courtyard mm. at least. So can we compare yeah. a, a traditional Hanuk layout with a Roman villa, you know, where they had an atrium in the center? Well, maybe there's some, some similarities, um, but as I said, the courtyard or atrium, it's, it's a very universal mm. um, topic or element in architecture. Sometimes you see modern architecture by Korean architects and they explain how they refer to traditional Korean architecture and it's usually something like, oh, so we have the courtyard, the madang here. And I just think, well, that's so universal and it's it's quite weak, actually, mm. something. But there's maybe um, some other similarities. You have the, the ondol, which is the floor heating, which is maybe slightly similar to the Roman um, heating system, the mm -hmm. hippocaust system. I don't know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> so you would have some similarities, but um, yeah, I wouldn't go too far to say it's it's um, something parallel. Is there some unique craftsmanship involved in building a, a hanok? Something that is not seen anywhere else, maybe in terms of the materials that are used? Well, usually you, you end up comparing Korean architecture to their counterparts in, in China or Japan. And you can say um, some basic principles are existent. For example, the wooden construction, the skeleton of the buildings, uh, that's a parallel. And you probably have to say that the basic construction principle came from China. That's at least what architecture historians would say. But um, throughout time and through the influence of culture and climate, the Hanuk has um, 
yeah, developed lots of very specific characteristics that differentiate it from mm -hmm. its uh, neighbors or neighboring architectures. You mentioned the ondo, the Korean yes. floor uh, heating. Do hanoks always have that system? And isn't the combination of heating under the floor with a wooden foundation inherently dangerous? Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's inherently dangerous. If it's made properly, mm. you won't have any problems. And it's also, I would say, a sort of misconception that wood is... Will catch fire easily. Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, um, as a material, wood is not considered to be um, easily flammable. So it's not as bad as most people might think. And plus, uh, you will find ondol in every residential building in Korea. It was always the tradition. And even poor people used to have ondol. So it's basically very, yeah, a very important um, element of Korean, Korean architecture. Very distinct for Korea itself, for its culture. Uh, they don't, you don't, won't find any ondol in Japan. And in China, maybe in some areas, uh, which used to be um, Manchuria, culturally, there um, it's the whole area, um, North Korea, Manchuria, where the Ondo probably originated from. So yeah, you have these two distinct parts, Ondo and the Maru, which is the wooden veranda, where the air can float uh, beneath it, which is basically a summer room. And you had the summer room, which emerged from yeah, the, the hot south. And you had the Ondo, which emerged in the cold northern areas and I think during Korea dynasty those two types met and the Hanuk as we know today was formed. As you mentioned earlier it is quite difficult not to see similarities um, between the Hanuk and traditional residences in Japan or in China. Um, is there a connection maybe for example with the Hutongs in Beijing? Do they have the same uh, concept behind them? How is the Hanuk different from these types of traditional housing? Uh, well the basic principle they share is first um, the courtyard and its functions. Uh, it functions as a like semi-private or semi-social uh, uh, space. Uh, it's always a space for interaction, housework and such things. So considering this basic layout, you will find some similarities. But in Hutong, you won't have um, the spatial elements we were talking about mm. before, the Undulbang and the Maru. That's very distinctively Korean, actually. Is symbolism an important part of designing and constructing hanoks? It depends on what you mean by symbolism. If you talk about um, uh, decorative elements mm. which like symbolize things, um, not so much in residential buildings. Uh, you have much more decoration and symbol symbolism and symbolic um, decorative elements in palaces or in the temples. But um, residential buildings used to be rather plain and. Uh, scarce of decorative elements so for my work i wouldn't say it plays such a big role hmm. do hanuk architects uh, and designers still find inspiration in traditional concepts uh, for example geomancy or feng shui principles mm -hmm. which used to be very very important when yes. building a landmark in in, in Chosan? yes actually geomancy the pung su is mm. it's more important than you might think at first sight <laughs> There's more people than you think who really care about Pung Su, Feng Shui, mm -hmm. or Geomancy, how we would say in English. So I would say as an architect, it helps to know a bit about it. Personally, I also think I should study more about it. It can be even problematic for architects if you do your planning work and then um, the client starts to, to contact someone who's who's an expert, expert in, expert in <laughs> geomancy and mm. it can really um it can really um interfere like to a very great extent in in the work you're doing so well personally i think it's it's i consider it as something cultural i think um it has maybe some backgrounds that you would call based on observation and uh, experiences so i don't have any problems with um, the basic geomancy so mm. Um, a certain location is good for people to settle because you have what you need. It's protected from wind, it's protected from, from water, um, such things. So mm. if you look at the ideal uh, location of a building according to geomancy, it's usually a place an architect would say, oh, it's a good place to build a house. Mm -hmm. so Makes some kind of rational sense. Sort of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it can exceed this level mm -hmm. and um, can be quite tricky at times, yes. <laughs> Now, moving on to the uh, evolution of the Hanok through, throughout history uh, in Korea, what changed over time, would you say? 
basically it's it's very interesting if you look at Korean architecture history you can see not only Korean architecture history I would say it includes the whole cultural sphere of um, China Korea and, and Japan the whole area here did not experience what we would call um, a distinct architectural era for example like you have in, in Europe you have uh, the Baroque era mm -hmm. and classicistic era and so on and so on and the differences between those periods are very distinct uh, in Europe in their forms in their spatial concepts in in Korea the history of architecture it's much more um, a sort of continuum mm. you have the basic principle of construction that has been unchanged well not unchanged but um, has remained similar over the course of time and the basic principles were set um, hundreds if not thousands of years ago and the changes you see are rather minor in comparison to Europe so we have a very static um, culture of architecture here. Coming from Europe where everything was built in stone, uh, it's quite hard to believe that buildings made out of wood, like the Hanok, would last um, centuries. So how old are the Hanoks really that we see in Seoul? Well, basically you have to say that wooden buildings are not necessarily short-lived in comparison to stone buildings. They are really, really uh, thousands of years old wooden buildings. I think in Japan there's one of the oldest wooden buildings, but I forgot how old it is. Mm -hmm. But it's not just a couple of uh, hundred of years. But in Korea, um, unfortunately, the oldest buildings are not as old because um, Korea's cultural or architectural heritage was destroyed over and over again through invasions, through war times. So um, I think the oldest buildings that are left are of the late Korea dynasty, but um, I think there's just very, very few left. Mm. What would be the average age of a Hanok in Seoul? If you go to Bukchon, wh when were those built? Basically, the, the Hanoks in Seoul are not that old. Uh, most of the substance that we see today dates back probably to the 50s and 60s. Mm. Uh, Hanoks were built in large scale up to the 60s, if I remember it correctly. And if you go to neighborhoods like um, Bunamdung, you will see many Hanoks built in a very um, yeah, systematic way. The alleys and streets are also very, very um, clear lined mm. and it, it's a yeah, sort of planned area. So that's where uh, most of the substance is from. The older substance dates back to the colonial period, which would be um, from 1910 to uh, 45. And just very, very, very few cases are older than that which is mostly the palaces or parts of the, the palaces, temples and basically residential buildings, there's really, really few, unfortunately. Does that mean that the Hanoks that we visit today are actually very different from those people used to live in during the Chosun dynasty? If you um, consider a Hanok, a traditional Hanok to be a Hanok dating back from Chosun dynasty, mm. you'd have to say yes, it's hard to see them. There's some cases left. Uh, some estates were preserved and moved to um, the Hanok village near Namsan, but um, they're not in the original setting, of course. Um, then there's estates like um, Peginje in Pukjon, which is one of the few uh, leftover um, yeah, original estates from that area, which used to be actually a quite a vast um, aristocratic area with uh, quite big buildings and um, very uh, wide plots. So what you see today um, is basically redeveloped during colonial period and after that, yes. During the Chosun period uh, and prior to that, did everyone live in a Hanok or was it only reserved to a privileged portion of society, a bit like manors and, and castles in Europe? Well, if you uh, post that question, it would um, basically mean that just the architecture of the aristocracy deserves to be called Hanok. Mm. So if you if you say well a Hanok has to be um, well a beautiful building with a tiled uh, roof with tiles, then yes it was just uh, limited to aristocrats and more well-off people. But personally, I think um, it's not a good idea to just reduce the uh, expression of Hanok to those yeah splendid um, buildings, because what you see today is large-scale deconstruction of buildings that people think are not worth preserving. And why do they think so? Because um, just those yeah, representative 
big buildings um, you can show to tourists or whatever are considered to be yeah, worth, worthy of uh, preservation. And that's one of the reasons why so much substance is lost up to today. To go back to our initial question at the beginning of the interview, why is the Hanok regaining popularity in South Korea? Yes, we talked about all the subsidies and such things before, but I think the actual reason is not the money you can get for remodeling Hanok. I think it's because many Koreans now start to long for a, a sort of, I would say, cultural identity. You can see that many people say, oh, well, I, I used to live in Hanok when I was younger, and I start like longing back to this sort of life. And you can really feel how many, many Koreans, um, they start feeling detached from the way they live, living in apartments, which don't give you any, um, yeah, yeah, any identity. It's not like your, your, your own home is like something you consume, but it doesn't give you identity. And I think, um, yes, Korea, since it is quite well off, it has developed um, tremendously economically, as everyone knows. And because people, they don't have to struggle for their daily survival anymore. Well, I think Korean society is um, quite competitive and hard to live mm. in, but um, still um, people, now it's the time for, for culture, for the cultural identity to be revived and for people to um, be aware of their roots and where they are coming from. And I think the Hanuk plays quite an important role here. Does that mean that those looking for Hanuks are generally hoping to use it as a private residence rather than a, a company or a hotel? Or I would say um, a huge part of the Hanuk construction is in the private sector for yeah, resident residential purposes. There is other projects. For example, there is also Hanok Hotel in, mm -hmm. in, in Gyeongju, which was built by uh, the architecture office Kuga, where I used to, to work it. And there's also many other examples, like um, Hanok libraries. There's a um, kids library in, in Kuro, I think. Mm -hmm. Kuro. Anyways, and many examples of ways to give Hanok's modern functions. But most parts are residential, I would say. Assuming someone would want to live in a Hanok today, what would be the main challenges? Uh, is it the heating in winter, maybe mold on the wood? What, what are the main issues people should be aware of? The main problems um, are nowadays the proper reconstruction. If you're talking about reconstruction and not building new Hanoks. Mm -hmm. um, the other things you mentioned, I don't think it's such a big problem. Like, um, like nowadays, if we reconstruct or um, let's better say not reconstruct, but um, remodel a Hanok, we would use insulation materials, we use modern heating systems. You still have the floor heating, but it would be a warm water system, of course. And um, you have modern kitchens, modern bathrooms. So the Hanoks today, I also think um, if people live in it, yeah, they should be given an environment that fits their needs, mm. their modern needs. Yeah. Exactly. Um, contemporary living probably means that the technology and the craft of the past mm -hmm. must be complemented with uh, modern ones. So how is that done? Which, which elements um, tend to get modernized? You, know, you need traditional skills for the, the roof works, wooden construction. It's usually made by traditional carpenters. And also, the tra if you need tradition, you want to have traditional windows, you have to use also carpenter with those skills. And so you see, there is um, many parts in the building, yeah, in the, constru in the construction um, process where you need uh, people with traditional skills. Uh, it's different when you talk about the heating system, for example, you just make um, modern floor heating. You can mm. just use a modern plumber, of course, mm. for the sanitary um, installations and such, such things. So it's basically um, yeah, a mix of modern and traditional craftsmen and people you, you need for the construction of a Hanuk that fits your modern needs. But if we use such modern techniques, how can the traditional nature of the Hanok be preserved? Are contemporary Hanoks maybe only traditional on the outside? Uh, well, it always depends on what kind of Hanuk you, you want to build. Hmm. If you want to build a totally traditional Hanok, there's still people who can do all parts of the works. For example, you can have traditional Ondol heating, which means you need like um, um, firewood for the winter. Um, but obviously it doesn't work in Seoul because um, I don't think it would um, meet legal standards to have like, a real fireplace with all the smoke and everything coming out. Mm. Um, so it's rather um, something you do in the countryside. But let's say you, you want to build a modern Hanok in Seoul, 
Yeah, as I mentioned before, you will have parts that remain traditional and parts that are modern. And I don't think it's awkward if you look at a remodeled Hanno, like our office. Um, most people do like it. Mm. <laughs> and we also try to preserve traditional techniques, but try to blend them with more modern needs. For example, the windows in our Hanok, they're made by a traditional carpenter, but in cooperation, we try to improve those windows. We use insulation glass, we use a ceiling for wooden windows, which we imported from Germany. And through such things, uh, you can improve the actual quality of the Hanok according mm. to modern needs quite a bit. What role do um, traditional materials, for example, especially grown in treated woods, play in this process. During a number of restoration projects in Korea, these efforts to stay true to the traditional building process received quite some attention. Yes, it's also, I think it's quite an important question, but you also have to differentiate between historic renovation and remodeling for residential purposes. Hmm. For example, our office, um, it's quite an old Hanok for sold standards. It probably dates back to the 30s, but it didn't have any um, original interior. So there was nothing in a sense of um, historic substance we had to preserve besides the main structure, which we did preserve. And in this case, it's not such a big question about uh, original materials. There is traditional materials that have quite some positive characteristics. For example, if you look around here, we used uh, lime plaster for the walls, well, for the ceiling here between the structure. And the lime plaster, for example, it has very positive effects on the climate within a room because it mm -hmm. regulates humidity. And also, the traditional materials are usually very um, good together with the wood, like physically speaking. Hmm. For example, in the old hanoks that were you know, remodeled in old times, they used a lot of concrete and stuff, and that can pose problems on the long term because um, the old materials used to regulate humidity uh, whereas if you have humidity in getting into the woods and you have a concrete wall, it won't dry out as fast. Mm. So you get yeah, more rotten parts and uh, more problems with um, with the um, termites. Mm. <laughs> termites, yes. Termites. So traditional materials are something you should always consider using in a Hanok, but of course you also have to consider insulation standards, for example, today. One problem, for example, is that the walls are quite uh, thin in a Hanok, and if you use just clay for the walls, it will not meet insulation standards, modern insulation standards. And also, um, personally, I think, well, for a historic building, it should be standard to use traditional materials, but if you have uh, in a residential project of Hanok remodeling, we don't have any historic substance to preserve, you should think about using modern materials, insulation materials, because uh, energy consumption, it's also a problem that affects us on a global level. And I think we can't say just because it's a Hanuk, um, we should not think about insulation. Complete change of topic. Uh, let's look at the Hanuk in its contemporary uh, context. We know how eager the South Korean government is to promote mm -hmm. um, Korean culture within and outside the peninsula. There's K-pop, Kugak, the cuisine. Um, but has the government taken any part in promoting the Hanuk in Korea, of course, but abroad. Korea does invest in research. Um, mm -hmm. uh, on the municipal level, um, lots of things are uh, happening, like the city of Seoul is um, subsidizing the Hanoks, as we talked about before. But personally, I think culture is n nothing that you can promote or um, that you can create with money, mm. investments. I think you can, can create an environment in which culture flourishes, but somehow it seems that Koreans think you can create culture through promotion and investment, economic investment. So my, my worry actually is that also the Hanuk area um, will go through this kind of, let's call it K-popification, <laughs> maybe. Mm. Yeah, I think culture is nothing you have to promote, um, and particularly not to promote to sell, uh, to sell to foreigners, to foreign tourists. If you go to, for example, the Hanok village in Chonju, which is the second most important uh, Hanok area in a bigger city in mm. Korea, maybe it's equal to the Pukchon area. It's, it's quite famous and it's, it's very nice, obviously, but it's not a historic preservation just as Pukchon is not. And I remember I went to a um, Korean cultural Exhibition. exhibition. I went to a Korean cultural exhibition once and 
there were these flyers promoting the Hanok, what was it called? Hanok Hub brand, they called it, the Hanok city of, the Hanok village in Jeonju. And there were expressions going around like K-style house. K-style uh, house? I, I find that very awkward because I would hope that Koreans become aware that culture is for themselves and culture is something that meets their needs and that's nothing you have to show off to foreigners if you create a culture that you love yourself that you 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 admire and cherish and and um, take care of very naturally something will occur that also tourists and foreigners will be fond of hmm. and i wish they would have a more natural approach to that and less yeah directed and uh, state driven or driven by economic needs but what is the ultimate goal of these government measures promoting the Hanok as a tourist attraction, uh, maybe in the context of short homestay programs or things like that? Or is it really re-establishing the Hanok as a place to live in, work in? I think maybe it's 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 a mixture of all mm. those things that you mentioned. There are also um, research projects uh, that try to find a way to lower the construction costs of Hanoks, uh, which is quite legitimate because the construction costs and uh, remodeling costs of Hanoks are much higher than for um, modern buildings. Well, it's a difficult difficult field and a difficult task because if you look at what happens if you lower the construction costs, you can see that yeah, the, the actual the handcraft gets lost and um, you can see it in the result. So on the one hand, I hope that it will just be preserved as yeah, a craftsmanship, as an architectural heritage. On the other hand, well, personally, I would also hope that there would be ways to make it um, uh, accessible to Koreans who don't earn that much money, which is a problem. So there's also uh, research going in this field, but there's also um, yeah attempts to promote Hanok as a tourist attraction that we were talking about before. Many, many um, guest houses have been popping up. There's even guest houses that will not accept Korean guests. We can just uh, uh, yeah be a guest if you're foreign, which I find quite awkward because you can see that many young Koreans are interested in Hanok. For them, Hanok is just the same as for foreigners. It's something yeah they don't really know. It's something um, they're not so familiar with, which mm. they get interested in. And I hope that in the future, yeah Hanok will be something more natural to Koreans. Daniel, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you for coming. This was Korea and the world. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.